Almost didn't make that. <laughs> Five verses is better. <laughs> but tonight we managed to make it in four. All right, please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. Tonight we're in Acts chapter 21, looking at the second half of the message begun last week, the gospel at Satan's throne. The gospel at Satan's throne. Very appropriate, I think, for the season of the year in which paganism and demonism celebrates so-called Halloween because we are at Satan's throne on that night of the year. But God used the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to break through Satan's darkness. October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the church door at Wittenberg and that began the Protestant Reformation, which brought the word of God to the forefront, the light of the gospel, the sword of the spirit, which is the one offensive weapon that God has given to us so that we might defeat Satan and all of his hosts. We're in Acts chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. And it came to pass that after we had gotten from them and had launched, we came with a straight course unto Coas, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence to Patara. And finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth. Now when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unlade her burden. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship and they returned home again. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you for what this portion of scripture has to teach us tonight. We pray that you might give us open hearts, listening ears, to understand church success and church failure, the responsibilities of both leadership and those who are congregants, to understand how the direction of your Holy Spirit in our lives sometimes is misunderstood by others who see things that they know will happen and yet your hand is upon those who are moving forward in obedience to your will. And so, Father, we pray for your blessings upon this time together tonight that our Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, perhaps you noticed as we were reading through that passage that there was not only a group of believers there at Tyre, and we discussed last week how those were not people who had been led to, by Paul to Christ on one of his other missionary journeys, but had been led to Christ by someone else, we don't know whom, but certainly the gospel had gone out through many other different means during this period of time after the church was disrupted by the Apostle Paul, who, or by Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul at Jerusalem, and the believers went everywhere preaching the word. But did you notice also, they were there for a whole week. Paul was there for a whole week waiting for his next ship. God gave him opportunity to spend time with these people that he had not spent at Ephesus. So Paul had the opportunity of making an impact on these folks who also brought him down to get on his next ship. But at Ephesus, he had met them at Miletus and called the elders of the church to come to him he spoke to them briefly, gave, gave them that incredible passage in Acts chapter 20 that we've studied in detail, and then was on his way. But here, God gave him the opportunity of tarrying for a whole week. He hadn't wanted to tarry. He didn't want to get hung up at Ephesus, but God made a divine delay for a whole week with a group of people that he'd never met before. And by the end of that week, we find they have developed a real bond of Christian love and charity and prayer one for another. Did you notice something else that 
these disciples also had the various spiritual gifts that were given during the early church period. So they didn't have to be those who had been disciples of Paul to have received the gifts. They had heard the word of God. The Holy Spirit was working in some very special ways that we've talked about during the apostolic period, not only giving the normal 22 gifts that were all given during that period of time, but among those 22, as you know, there were seven that were temporary gifts during the time of the apostles, the miraculous gifts, we would call them, those so-called charismatic gifts, the gifts of apostle, prophet, healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the gift of knowledge, which was the ability to receive new special revelation from God and then communicate that new special revelation. Wisdom is still being given. That's a spiritual gift also listed. But the gift of knowledge is different from the gift of wisdom. The gift of knowledge was the ability to receive new revelation from God. Wisdom is the ability to understand and apply God's word to the real life settings of each one of our lives. Each of us have different circumstances in life, but God's wisdom is applicable and available to every one of us so that we might know what God wants us to do in any particular given situation. But the gift of knowledge was new revelation. And someone here had the ability to know that there were going to be bad things happening at Jerusalem. And Paul has mentioned that all along, that every place he went, there were people who were telling him, Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, bad things are going to happen. Here is this isolated group of believers at a place which had been historically the seat of Satan, who knew that bad things were going to happen at Jerusalem. And yet Paul was compelled in the spirit to go on. It tells us that they said to Paul through the spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. You know, many times we might have an understanding of what the future holds, not because of the gift of knowledge, but because we can read the word of God. We've got the final revelation now. But it may not apply to someone else who must suffer. You better not go to that country because it's a Muslim country and the Muslims are killing Christians right now and you certainly wouldn't want to go to a place where they will take you and ISIS will cut off your head. But, says the one to whom we speak, I must go for that is where God has called me to preach the gospel. But you'll be killed. I must go for that is where God has called me to preach the gospel. But, but don't you realize I must go because that's where God has called me to preach the gospel. Temporal danger is never a reason for disobeying the call of God. If it were, missions would have never spread to the worst countries of the world where today there are great lights of the gospel of Christ because someone either risked their life or gave their life for the good news of Jesus. Interesting to see when we had accomplished those days we departed and went our way and they all brought us on our way with wives and children. Can you imagine being one of the children in that group, having the privilege of meeting and hearing the Apostle Paul and growing up and telling your children and grandchildren at least two more generations of those seven days where Paul was among you sharing the good news of Christ. These are real people. These are real events. Put yourself in the situation of being at a little outpost where the devil has been ruling for centuries. A little outpost of the gospel of Christ. And having God give you the encouragement not just of having Paul pass through town and wave, but of being there for a whole week. And when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship and they returned home again. They didn't say, Paul, 
you know, it's so good that we've met you. We really need to get out of this place. Let us go with you to Jerusalem. Or, Paul, don't you think God has called us to some place that is easier than Tyre? They returned home again. God puts each one of us exactly where he wants us at exactly the point in our lives, at exactly the point in history where he has something for us to do. Why are you here at this point in history? Some of you were here before when the place was filled. Some of you were here in the glory days. But why are you here as a little outpost on the front edge of the impending battle? At the edge of where Satan has his seat. What is the call that God has put on your life? What is it that he's called you to do in spite of the danger? There was danger for Paul going to Jerusalem, but there was danger for the believers at Tyre. We can never get to a situation whereby we are totally exempt from the danger of the battle unless we entirely disengage ourselves from the calling that Christ has given to us. You recall that when we were in chapter 20, we learned that there are 12 categories of temptation the believers commonly fall into. That was lesson number six. There are 12 temptations that Paul covers that face every Christian. From 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we learn that almost all temptations fall into at least one of these 12 categories. The first was failure to know the Bible history and heroes of the faith. That's a matter of sloth. God has given us the scripture, so if we don't learn it, it's a matter of sloth. Second was faith in fearful times. We live in fearful times. Do you have faith? Faith believes the word of God and then obeys the word of God. The third was open identification with Christ. How many of us hide our Christian testimony under the cloak of a smiley face and just being nice? But we never speak of Jesus to those who are our neighbors, our friends, our fellow employees, people that we meet casually, family members who don't know Christ, who've told us they don't want to hear about it anymore. And so we just smile and go about our business. Open identification with Christ is one of the tests, and it is a temptation that many Christians fail. Spiritual growth, spiritual fellowship, responding to spiritual discipline for disobedience, anger, gluttony, sloth, pride, lust, envy, and greed. With many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. The lusts of the flesh, idolatry, entertainment, Sex, rebellion, complaining. Almost everything falls into those 12 different categories. And then we saw three applications related to example, warning, and a five-fold guarantee. Now, all these things happen unto them for examples. And they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Then warning, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And then the guarantee of commonality, divine faithfulness, strategic placement in the battle, power and victory. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. 
It's an excellent passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. And then paralleling that, we saw that there are 23 specifically stated biblical qualifications for elders in Scripture and 17 specifically stated biblical qualifications for deacons, with a significant number of them re relating directly to family life and that none of those are optional. And to ignore one or more biblical qualifications to put the church in jeopardy. Even when men don't meet all those qualifications, they can still fall into sin that disqualifies them from church leadership. And Paul listed those in Titus chapter 1 and 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now, I'm trying to tie it together tonight because that's what we see happening as we get to chapter 21. Tonight we hope to see how the churches where Satan set up his throne, churches that mostly crashed and burned, were churches that failed in the requirements for biblical church leadership and allowed specific sins from Paul's list in 1 Corinthians 10. I just gave you those 12 different things. Who allowed those things in the church to go undisciplined. Now last week we saw that when Paul arrived at Tyre, he found disciples who were already there. Not from his missionary journeys, but perhaps from Barnabas and Mark, but were not told. But others besides Paul were spreading the word. And we tend to forget this. We saw then that there were three whole chapters in Ezekiel, chapters 26, 27, and 28, that are given to curses against Tyre, the place where this tiny little church was located. Tyre had historically been the seat of Satan, and two persons are mentioned there in those chapters in Ezekiel, the prince of Tyre and the king of Tyre. And remember, God invades Satan's territory. God had done that in Tyre. With that small group of believers, God had invaded Satan's territory. And God defeated the enemy. Do you remember the story of Gideon? Gideon started out with a pretty big army. But God said, you got too many people for me to win the battle and get the glory. You need to get rid of some of them. And so he said, tell everybody who's a chicken. Tell them all to go home. And a huge number packed their bags and got out of there. God said, you still got too many. We need to, to figure out who we're going to take. Make them all go down and take a drink of water. Hey, that's a pretty nice thing to do on a hot day. So they all went down there and some of them splashed right on their faces into the water and sucked up as much as they could. And others went down and looking around, licked it up in their hands like this while they're keeping their guard up. Only 300 did that. God said, send everybody else home. Now, if you were the commander in chief of that particular army, what would you be thinking about that time? Lord, I think we got it in reverse. God says, no, I got exactly what I want. You take those 300. Here's what you're going to do. Give them all trumpets. Give them all torches and pitchers to put over the top of their torches. Have them go up on the side of the mountain. And when I give the signal, rate those pitchers, hold the torches aloft, blow the trumpets and shout the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And see what happens, what I will do. God was about to defeat a superior army. And the Midianites went into a panic and killed each other in the dark, running around, thinking it was the enemy. God invades Satan's territory. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Gates stand still. Armies attack gates. Satan's gates always fall when God's people do what God tells them to do. And it doesn't matter how many there are on either side. Even when there's a tiny group like this, a tiny group like this, if God is with us, 
who can be against us? Never forget that. We tend to think in human terms. But there's nothing we could possibly do. Look at how empty we are here. Dear people, spiritual warfare is one with spiritual weapons. Do you have on the entire armor of God? Are you wielding the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God? That's the only thing that has power. How much scripture did you read this past week? Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. I have counted thy word more than my necessary food. How much time did you spend eating versus how much time did you spend studying scripture? Consuming that which makes you spiritually strong. How much time during this last week did you spend memorizing scripture and meditating on it? Are you prepared for the battle that we will face as a small group but armed with the word of God, a victorious group? I'm not merely making dramatic pauses. I'm hoping that God is convicting hearts because it is his power, not ours, that wins the victory. And what he has given for the victory is his word. A small group, a handful of believers at Satan's throne. But what they had was the gospel of Christ. Yes, we saw the Prince of Tyre, we saw the King of Tyre. The Prince of Tyre is the human king. The king of Tyre was the fallen angel Lucifer, the light bearer. Interesting how he imitates Christ. We talked about light and darkness this morning. He was the light bearer who put out the light and plunged himself and all the world into darkness. He became Satan, the devil, the one who is called our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion who walks about seeking whom he may devour. And then it says, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished upon your brethren that are in the world. We've been called not to be afraid of him, but to resist him in the power of the Spirit of God and with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, clothed in the armor of God, which defends us and protects us, and in the power of the Spirit of God and not in the power of the flesh. A small group at Tyre, but a group that was victorious, who had a beachhead, who had stormed the gates of hell. We talked about Tyre having two parts originally and thinking it was an impregnable fortress. And then first the attack of Nebuchadnezzar, which drove them out to the island as Nebuchadnezzar leveled the city that was on the mainland. And then the days of Alexander, 332, when Alexander had all of his soldiers scrape up all the dust of Tyre and all the rocks and pour it into the ocean until he made a causeway where he could march out to Tyre and defeat it. Now we talked about how the Bible makes it clear that Satan rotates his seat between locations depending on his current plans and attempts at world governance. 
And sometimes he had Jewish headquarters, we saw verses on that, and sometimes he had Gentile headquarters, as we saw in Ezekiel. Now, I want to take a look at the seven churches of Revelation to see two things. Number one, the key church sins listed in all the locations where Satan set up his headquarters. And secondly, the key characteristics of the faithful believers who lived in those locations, because that will be instructive for us in this day and age. Number one, the key church sins listed in the locations where Satan set up his headquarters, sins that cause God's judgment on those churches, and secondly, the key characteristics of the faithful believers who lived in those locations. And I hope that these things will be edifying to us because they certainly apply. Revelation chapter 1, in the Son of Man vision, the Lord Jesus Christ appears and is speaking to John, his amanuensis, and he says something very important in verses 19 and 20. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. There are three tenses li listed there in that verse. That's verse 19. There's the past tense, the things which thou hast seen. What did you see? That's past. Number two, I want you to write about the things that are. That's present tense. The things that are going on right now. Third, I want you to about, write about the things which shall be hereafter. That's future tense. That's the things that haven't happened yet the things that are not happening right now, but the things that will happen because I guarantee they will happen, says God, says our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 20 tells us how it's going to apply. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. So he's going to explain to us one of the 17 mysteries of the New Testament. Things not revealed in the Old Testament, but now revealed unto the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 3. That's what tells you what a mystery is. The seven stars are the angels, the angeloi, the messengers of the seven churches. The seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And then we move into chapters 2 and 3 which are the letters of Jesus to the seven churches. But remember, this is going to be things that he'd seen, past tense, things that are currently at that time, and things that will be. That's the context of the letters to the seven churches. So what you see here in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 is not just about seven churches in Asia Minor that existed sort of in a fan shape around the island of Patmos from which John writes the epistle of Revelation. That's the things that were, the things that were going on at that time. But he says, this also applies to the things that are going to come in the future. So as you look at the seven churches, you will see those were seven historic churches. They existed before Paul, or rather John, wrote the letters to them. And some stuff had been going on. Those were seven churches where certain things were going on that were characteristic of those churches. But those were things that were designed to teach the church today what was going to happen as we moved into the future from that point things that relate to different periods of church history, but things that relate to specific churches today as we are faced with the same pressures and temptations and tests that the early church faced. The devil doesn't change his tactics. He may change some of the mechanisms, but the tactics remain the same. His tactic is to destroy the church. Now, they didn't have the internet back then. They didn't have... Um, 
slick, glossy pornographic magazines back then, but they had plenty of other things that are along the same line that pushed toward the evil ends that Satan wanted to accomplish in undermining the church. Church number one. It's the church at Ephesus. The church at Ephesus was the fundamentalist church that became rigid, doctrinally correct, but mechanical in its ministry. And as a result, it lost its love for Christ. Under the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now he just told us that the seven stars were the seven angeloi, the seven messengers, or we would call them the pastors, of the seven churches. Pastors of different kinds of churches throughout church history. Remember, it's still future tense that's going to... This stuff points not just back to what had been and what was going on then, but it points to the future. That means it's pointing to us. There are fundamentalist churches today that are rigid. They are doctrinally correct, but they are mechanical in their ministry. And the first and greatest indictment against any of the seven churches is against a doctrinally sound church. A church that always did it right. There were no missing wheels, no missing gears, no missing cogs. Everything ran like a smooth machine. They knew how to test people with false doctrine and get rid of them. They had their examination committees. They made sure that everybody dotted their I's and crossed their T's. But the greatest indictment in all seven letters is against the church at Ephesus. Their indictment, they had lost their love for Christ. It all looked good. It all was rigid and square and perfectly precise. But they had forgotten the motivation for why they were doing what they were doing. Some of us here have been in love. And you know what a euphoric feeling that is. The intense joy and delight and pleasure in humbly serving someone else that you really love. The blessing of marriage. The blessing of the closest possible friendship. The intense feeling of security and joy, knowing that you not only love, but that you are loved. And how sad it is to see a marriage which may be in the euphoria of youth had been a marriage where there was intense, passionate love. begin to fade over the years to where, oh, they're faithful to one another. They always do everything exactly the way the other wants them to do it. They function together like a well-oiled machine. But there's no longer any love. They know how to make a good show on the front. They know how to never argue in public. 
They know that they must never argue in front of their children. They always function appropriately with the husband as the head of the house and as the wife in humble, submissive obedience to him. But they're no longer motivated to do it by love, but merely by habit. It's become mechanical. Love has left the marriage. We've been called to love him because he first loved us. And our motive for serving is not merely because we've always done it that way before, or we do it that way because we know we got to do it that way, or we do it the right way because we know that otherwise we'll get spanked and chastened of the Lord, and all the thousands of other myriad of reasons that we give for doing it and obeying, but we've lost the real motive, which is love for Christ. As leaders, we have to examine ourselves and see, are we doing this because we love Christ or are we doing it because we get money or we get control of people or we get the feeling of importance or some other carnal reason? As people, congregants of the church, are we showing up because, well, people expect us to show up? Do we, in a sort of bedraggled way, drag ourselves in? Well, we don't like to get there on time because, after all, you know, our time is valuable, but, but we do have to show up. When you were courting somebody that you loved, did you plan for it in advance? Did you try to look your best? Were you eager to see the person? Were you excited about being there so that you could hardly wait for the hours to go past until you could get into your car and go to where they were and show up a little bit early? Because you wanted to spend as much possible time with them as you could? Or did you just sort of yawn and think, oh no, I gotta go out on a date tonight. Man, I would much rather sit home and, you know, flip through a sports magazine. Or, man, I wish he wasn't coming tonight. I mean, I know I'm dating him, and I know I'm supposed to be in love with him, but I hope he's late because after all, I just want to lounge around on the couch and eat chocolates. Is that how you felt when you were in love? The church at Ephesus was a doctrinally sound church. They knew their theology. They knew their church history. They had their systematic theology. But they'd lost their love for Christ, the excitement of being with him and with the believers as they gathered for worship. Nobody was ever late to the services at Ephesus. They knew the right things to do. Leaders and people. Ephesus, the fundamentalist church that became rigid, doctrinally correct, but mechanical in its ministry because it had lost its love for Christ. 
what were the last questions that Jesus asked at the end of the Gospel of John? He asked it three times. Peter, do you love me? That's what Jesus wants to know. That's what Jesus wants to know. Do you love me? There's something else here in this section dealing with the Ephesian church. Down in verse 6 it says, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The last thing he says about them is that they do have a very important character quality which had kept them from the attacks of Satan. They hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. He's already warned them that they don't get their act together concerning love. He is going to jerk their church off the face of the map. The immediate preceding verse, he says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. The candlestick is the church, remember? Verse 6, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Takes you back to creation. Ephesus, the first of the churches, takes you back to creation. It's a rather important doctrine from the first book of the Bible to the last book of the Bible. And in the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, you see the tree of life appearing once again. The Nicolaitans are also mentioned as infiltrating the church at Pergamos. We'll look at that in just a moment. Did you know that was a problem in the first century church that continues today? The doctrine of the Nicolaitans is still with us today. In the letter to Pergamos, which is our third letter down here, we're told that they had the doctrine of Balaam. Now, we won't do a full study on Balaam tonight, but you know basically what the problem with Balaam was. Balaam wanted money no matter what happened to anybody else. Balaam wanted money regardless of God's promises. Balaam wanted money more than he wanted the spiritual blessings of God. Balaam wanted to have interaction with the world whereby he could get their money by giving them what they wanted. Covetousness. The doctrine of Balaam is that material wealth is worth compromising spiritual truth. The doctrine of Balaam is that you can always find a way to get greedy money if you can find a way around God's commands. The doctrine of Balaam is the doctrine of looking for loopholes. The second thing that's mentioned is immorality because that's what Balaam was involved in, getting God to curse Israel by having those Moabitish girls go down to the camp of Israel and committing fornication. That immoral sex is okay. The Nicolaitans historically had what they called the community of women. We're moving toward that here in the United States, folks. The third thing that we discover as we look at Pergamos is that they were eating things offered to idols no matter how it affected weaker believers. The Apostle Paul spends an entire chapter, chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians. We're not going to go there tonight. I'll read you just one verse out of it. But where he talks about things that are offered to idols. He says, you know, there is nothing wrong with that meat that has been offered in an idol temple. In fact, that's probably the best meat at the best prices. There's no such thing as idol cooties. 
It doesn't have special bugs on it that will poison you. But you need to recognize that there may be a weaker brother who has come out of that paganism, who used to go and worship at those temples in the horrifying, immoral ways that they so-called worshipped their pagan gods and offered sacrifices to those pagan gods which are in reality demons. And when he sees you sitting at meat at the restaurant right outside the temple where they serve that meat, although he has a conscience that reminds him of all the things that he used to do there, he will be emboldened to go back and do it again because he sees you as the stronger brother eating meat offered to idols. Nicolaitan said, we don't care how it affects anybody else. It's our Christian liberty. They had no concept of what Christian liberty is all about. Christian liberty is not the right to do what you want. Christian liberty, Christian freedom, is the supernatural divine power that God gives you to do what you ought. Not the flesh giving you the right to do what you want. True freedom comes when, by the power of the Spirit of God, we do what God designed us to do. That's freedom. When you're doing what God designed you to do, that's where you find no destruction. That's where you find life. That's where you find things flying in the, in, in the wonderful atmosphere of heaven. But they said, we don't care how it affects others. Do you remember back in Acts chapter 15? We studied that five chapters ago. The council at Jerusalem. What was one of the points of instruction? And this applies in principle across the board to all kinds of things that cause weaker brothers to stumble. What was one of the principles, the key principle, that was determined at the council in Jerusalem? It was what is required of the Gentiles. No, they don't have to be circumcised. No, they don't have to come back under the law. They, we couldn't keep the law. They can't keep the law either. But there were some things that they said, write this to the Gentiles because of the background that they came out of, because of the, the things that they were used to doing. Let me read you verse 29. That you abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. What are we told about the Nicolaitans? They were teaching, hey, it's okay to disobey what the Council of Jerusalem said, because, hey, after all, it doesn't really matter. We've got Christian liberty. We have freedom in Christ. We're still facing that today, folks. Acts 21, 25. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. We see it again in the same chapter in which we're studying tonight. Just a few verses farther down. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 10, the one verse I told you I'd read you. For if any man see thee which has knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? The big argument, of course, in Christian colleges is, well, there's nothing wrong with drinking. I got so sick of hearing that when I was back at Gordon College. Students arguing about that. There were some students there who'd come out of alcoholic homes, who had alcohol in their backgrounds, and Christ had given them victory over it, who were quiet about it. But other students who thought that they had the Christian liberty to drink. 
And so they argued it and they did it. And when the weaker brethren, who had come out of that kind of a background, saw it and thought, well, these are strong Christians, got back into it. I used to work at a rescue mission where we pulled drunks off the streets of Boston, pulled them into the rescue mission, gave them a dinner, and shared Christ. One of them had been a former alcoholic and drug addict. And he said, you know, now that I've become a believer, I don't even walk down the streets where those bars are located because of the temptation. Dear people, you never know who around you has been involved in something that had pulled them into sin. A weaker brother. The Nicolaitans didn't care because they had Christian liberty. Number three. The third thing about the Nicolaitans was they mixed pagan worship with Christian worship to appeal to what we would call today seeker-friendly churches. We want to make the unbelievers feel at home when they come in here. So all you women just wear your halter tops. Come in here with all your bare skin showing its tattoos. Come in here just hugging and kissing. And we will give you a show like the world will love. We got our rock musicians up on the stage. We got our flashing lights. We've got the heavy metal bands up there wiggling and gyrating on the stage. There are a bunch of Christian colleges doing that today, too. Colleges that used to be known as fundamentalist colleges. Having Winterfest with rock bands and flames flowing up in the air as the guys in super tight pants get up there and wail on their guitars. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans. They mixed pagan worship with Christian worship to appeal to, quote, seeker friendly churches like the rock music and the charismatic churches today and all the showmanship. Number five, did you know? We discover these things as we study church history, as we read what are called the church fathers, the anti nicene church fathers. They tell us about the things that were going on among the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans denied God to be the creator of the world and attributed its existence to other powers. Does that sound familiar in the 21st century? They denied that God was the creator of the world, but they attributed its existence to other powers like theistic evolutionists do today. The Nicolaitans are still with us today. And they've infiltrated many so-called evangelical churches. and evangelical colleges. If you want a list of the colleges that actually hold to biblical creationism, Answers in Genesis has put out an entire list of colleges that have signed a doctrinal statement stating that they believe in a literal six-day creation in the range of about 6,000 years ago. It will boggle your mind to read the list and discover which Christian colleges are not on the list. Doctrines of the Nicolaitans. It's been suggested this can't be proved, but it certainly fits, that the Nicolaitans were possibly founded by Nicholas, one of the first deacons in Acts chapter 6, 
verse 5. It tells us there that he was a proselyte of Antioch. In other words, he was a Gentile who first converted to Judaism. He was somebody coming from Antioch who was a proselyte. A proselyte is somebody who converts out of the Gentile world into Judaism. And then he converted to Christianity. And he had such good act. He had it all together so that in Acts chapter 6, when they were choosing the first set of deacons, he was one of the seven who was chosen to take care of the widows in the church. Shouldn't surprise us. Remember what Paul said about the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. He said, from among your own selves, not just the wolves coming in from the outside, but from among your own selves, a bunch of you guys are going to rise up and split the church, seeking to lead people after yourselves. You want the power, you want the control, you want the honor, you want the glory, you want the people. You know, Coming out of that kind of a background, being first converted to Judaism, then to Christianity, and realizing, hey, I'm not under the law. And we've talked about that. We are not under the law of Moses. The law cursed you, condemned you, proved to you that you could not be saved by your works, nor sanctified by your works either. So he had come into Judaism, probably because there was structure, there was not all the wild stuff that he'd gone through before, and he thought, I'm safe here. And then he came into Christianity and said, wow, this is, this is great. And he began to learn about his Christian liberties, and his Christian freedoms, and said, well, why don't we just bring some of that other stuff back, and maybe that'll attract other people who used to be like me, and, and let's get all that stuff into the church. He had a background in pagan worship and practices which then filtered into the church. I can't believe our time is up. <laughs> I've only gotten through the church at Ephesus with a little touch on the church at Pergamos. The next one is Smyrna, then Pergamos, then Thyatira. Oh my. People who were good at practical Christianity, but doctrinally effective, they were the exact opposite of what was going on at Ephesus. Then Sardis, then Philadelphia, then Laodicea. Each one of these churches where Satan had set up headquarters and where he had infiltrated either was faithful and suffered or compromised and got the condemnation of Christ. That's the choice that we have, people. Be faithful and expect persecution or compromise and expect the condemnation of Christ. Which will it be? Where will you fall? In which of these six church, seven churches will you be seen? Because remember, this is the things that were, the things that are, and the things that will be. We're in the things that will be, period. And all of us will fit into either the commendation or the condemnation of these seven churches. We'll have to pick it up from there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your word and for its power. Now we thank you that you are the one who attacks and makes the beachhead into Satan's territory, that the, the gates of hell can't prevail against you and against your church. And yet we also understand that it is a spiritual war and Satan does not like to take captives, he likes to destroy them. Help us to be faithful, help us to use the armor that you've given us and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Help us not to compromise. Help us to recognize where the temptations and the tests will come, where the attack will fall, and then help us to stand firm in the faith, nothing wavering, 
Help us to walk by faith. To live by faith. To walk in the power of the Spirit of God. To resist the devil after we have submitted to God. And he will flee from us. Those are the promises of your word. And your word is true. So, Father, we thank you for this time we've had tonight. We pray that you'll bless our hearts with it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn.